Good evening. It's good to see everyone back out this evening. We had a good service this morning. Pray the Lord be with us tonight. We have another good service. Amen. Brother Ronnie Crane, would you lead us in prayer, please? If you would stand, get your All American Church hymnal. Let's turn to page number 131, New Name in Glory. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found. That he always kept his word There's a new name written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine And the white robed angels sing the story A sinner has come home There's a new name written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not but God's angry frown. When the heavens opened and I saw that my name was written down There's a new name written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine And the white robed angels sing the story A sinner has come home There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. In the book is written, saved by grace, oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know by the blood I am made whole There's a new name written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine White robed angels sing the story A sinner has come home There's a new name written down in glory And it's mine with my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Be seated. Yeah. Remember what the Lord told him about demons? He said, Rejoice because your name's written in heaven, not because the devil's subject to you. Good to be here, folks. Good to have you. If, uh, if we have anybody tonight, first time, we'd like you to raise your hand. We'll give you a card, let you fill it out. Drop it in a plate and it passes in a little while. All right. Well, good to have you, folks. We had some folks from South Carolina and Alabama this morning. And we're glad. I care where they're from. They could be from Timbuktu, as far as I'm concerned. They're welcome. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Tasted death for every man. Yeah. Pray that uh, meet Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for a prayer meeting. I know that I gave you an awful lot of stuff this morning. I realize that. I put, I don't know, 10 hours, 12 hours of study to get all that together. But the thing is, I'll bring it back up again. I'll bring it back up again. See, there's a way to handle stuff like that. That's the way we study. Good night, man. You can't get it all in one sitting. You've got to go back over it and study it and digest it and, and make sense of what you're doing and what you're looking at. All right. Okay. Uh, 
let's see, we'll have the, uh, the ushers come up here. We'll take up the morning, the evening offering. Got the ushers here. Brother Mike Caldwell, lead us in prayer, please. like to invite the choir up this evening. We'll be singing out of the All-American Church Hymnal, page number 213, where we'll never grow old, all that will come up.
If you would, stand again. Get your All-American Church hymnal. Let's turn to page number 89. Let's do the first, second, and the last verse face to face. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face in honor behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Only faint the I will see him with the darkling veil between. But a blessed day is coming where his glory shall be seen face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by face to face oh blissful moment face to face to see and know face to face with my redeemer Jesus Christ who loved me so face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Amen. Lord bless you. Be seated as the choir comes down. specials tonight. Here we have Debbie McLeod and Michelle Keaton going to be singing for us. Children 
my neighbors and all my friends. When I'm in Jesus, then all others will know. Lord, will you empty me of every selfish thing that would hinder my sweet walk with thee? Shine down upon me and fill me anew in every way, Lord. Let me be more like you. Shine down upon me and fill me anew in every way, Lord. Let me be more like you. message of the Bible, folks. It's the Lord of the Bible. Amen. That's what counts. That's good singing tonight. All right. If you have your Bible, I'd like to turn with me to the book of Psalms. Book of Psalms, chapter number 11. 
And verse number three. Psalms 11, 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. When you talk about Israel, you talk about the ancient people. That's what they're called. They've been around a long time. When you talk about America and its length of time, here it's a baby nation. When you look at America, it's a melting pot. It's an experiment. If you remember the Gettysburg Address, if you'll remember it, look at some of the words that Abraham Lincoln used in that address about whether a nation so conceived shall ever endure. And then when you look at, look at uh, Japan, if you, I don't know if you do much reading at all, but if, uh, if, you, were, if you were in Japan, uh, they would not necessarily welcome you, no matter who you are. The reason for that is because they want to maintain their racial purity. They want the Japanese to remain Japanese. Yep. And so therefore, this is their country, this is their land. And when you go back and study World War II and some of the motives involved in it, they definitely, the Japanese thought they were racial, racially superior. And then, of course, you had Hitler over there preaching his doctrine of racial superiority too. And so when you go back and look at these things, it helps you understand. America is different, though. It is definitely an experiment. Shall this nation so conceived, shall it endure? So the Bible says in verse number three, the foundations be destroyed. So what are the foundations of this country? Well, I'm going to talk about seven men, seven men tonight who, are, who affected this country and are still affecting this country from the grave. First one is Charles Darwin. You all know about him. In the 1850s, he wrote The Origin of the Species. That became the Bible of, uh, of atheism. They had something to grab, something to latch on to, to do away with the Bible. The Scopes Monkey Trial down there in Dayton, Tennessee, I think it was 1926, 29, somewhere along in there. Uh, Clarence Darrow came down and he wanted to make a fool out of uh, uh, Williams Jennings Bryan because Williams Jennings Bryan was a Christian. Darrow was uh, more or less an atheist and an agnostic. Do you really believe in the book of Genesis that it is accurate? Is it not simply a bunch of old wives' tales and fables? And of course, we know what happened at the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial. In Karl Marx, Karl Marx is having a definite effect on the world. Who is he? Well, he's given the credit of being the father of communism. And uh, Das Kapital was the book he wrote. And in other words, The Capitalist, that's what it was about. It's about the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and all of his take on what it takes to make up a society and how can you be fair to everybody. On the surface of it, it all sounds great. But if you go to Russia today, you'll find it's not run by communism. It's run by oligarchs. And an oligarch has to do with somebody who's got a pile of money. Yeah, yeah. So there seems to be a big issue over there making money. They say that uh, Putin is one of the richest men around, that he's got all kinds of money piled up. I remember reading something not too long ago where some Russian uh, workers out in the field says, uh, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay. <laughs> well, I thought it's pretty good. That was the idea among those people. They don't have anywhere near what we have. But Karl Marx started something, and it has, its, uh, it has definite ramifications. But I'm going to move along. Julius Wellhausen, have you ever heard of him? Most people haven't. But if you've done a little research, you'll know who he is. It comes from, the, from, the, from German higher criticism of the 1800s, and it comes from the idea of the school of criticism and the, the, the documentary hypothesis, which is the foundation of it. So what is that? They do not believe the Bible is the Word of God, and that has a direct effect on what's happening in this nation right now. Here's a, here's a little, uh, little tract on it. It says, the tradition credits Moses as the author of Genesis. Notice ter carefully tradition. As well as the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the Pentateuch. But modern scholars, especially from the 19th century onward, in other words, the 1800s uh, onward, see them as being written hundreds of years after Moses is supposed to have lived in the 6th and 5th centuries B.C., we call them minimalist, based on, listen to this now, scientific interpretation of archaeological, genetic, and linguistic evidence, most scholars consider Genesis to be primarily Judeo-Christian mythology. 
rather than historical. Now imagine some young man going off to a Bible college and that's what he's taught. In plain words, the Old Testament uh, essentially is just a bunch of wives tales and fables and so forth and is no more, uh, can no more be trusted than, than, uh, than anything. But the Old Testament passages, I did a little research into this and I said, well, I said, what about the Lord Jesus Christ? Did he believe the Old Testament was the word of God? Did he believe it? And that's important. That's important because you see the documentary hypothesis has to deal with the New Testament also. It's got to deal with the person of Christ. Well, he believed in the creation of Adam and Eve, Mark 10. He believed in the murder of Abel, Luke 11. He believed in the corruption of Noah's day and the flood, Luke 17. And the, law, and the, and the corruption of Lord's, uh, Lot's day and the fire. He believed in the worldliness of Lot's wife, the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses in the burning bush, Moses in the heavenly manna, Moses in the brazen serpent. Are you getting somewhere here now? These are all things Christ quoted. And David in the showbread, and Solomon in the queen of Sheba, Elijah, a widow in a famine, Naaman and his leprosy, the murder of Zechariah, Daniel and the abomination of desolation that I preached about this morning, Jonah and the whale, and Jonah and the repentance of the Ninevites. And during his last Passover night, predicting the world would hate the disciples as they hated him. He quoted Psalm 35. His utterances on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22, and he quoted Psalm 31, verse number five, along with many, 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 many others. The two on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, the Bible says he took them to the Old Testament and beginning with Moses and the prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ began to expound to them the things written in the scriptures that applied to him. Let me tell you, I love archaeology. I, I read it all the time. I, the BAR, the Biblical Archaeology uh, Magazine, I get that and I read it and research it and I love archaeology. Make no mistake about it. They have never turned over one piece of dirt that has disproven the Word of God. This is all a bunch of garbage in their minds. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight? I certainly do. No question in my mind about it. And he believed in the Old Testament. He called it the Scriptures. Paul said of Timothy, Timothy, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation. John Dewey, who is this? He has a definite effect on what's happening right now. He was the one who argued for an educational system, a problem, in other words, a public educational system. He argued for that and said that's what we need. I did a little research into public education. According to the National Center for Educational Statistics, 21% of adults in the United States, that's about 43 million, fall into the illiterate, functionally illiterate category. Yeah. Somebody's failing somewhere. Yeah. That just has to do with academics. It has nothing to do with the social structure of what's going on. We'll get to that in just a moment. It has to do with that almost a quarter of the male part of the, uh, the adult population of this country can't read, they can't write. And folks, that's fundamental. Once you learn how to read, you can research for yourself. You have a library out here that you can read. It's all kinds of, of material available. But if you can't read, that's a terrible handicap. Now, maybe you're here tonight and you can't. Nobody's up here making fun of you. No. Nobody's up here dragging you across the coals. Uh, it's my, the fact of the matter is a lot of people would help you if you get into a situation like that. So, you know, you have nothing to be ashamed of if uh, for different reasons. You've grown up and you weren't able to get it, uh, to be able to, to get an education where you're literate, where you can read. But this is the product of the public school system. This is what John Dewey is pumping out today. And uh, I tell you, I'm amazed at the people I talk to that say, you know what, preacher? We homeschool our kids. We homeschool them. A few years back, about 30 years ago, the, 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 the educational system in the country came out and said, now look, you're, you're, you're depriving these kids of an education with these, with these Christian schools and with, this, and, with the, and with this homeschooling. You're depriving them of a good education. I said, oh. <laughs> when they went to college and took the college entrance exams, they scored higher. Right. Amen. They weren't deprived of anything. They got a better education. And of course, I understand tonight, and you do too. There may be places you need tutors, areas that you can't handle yourself. I'll understand all of that. But you know the truth of the matter is, I honestly believe 
that if the public education, if education was taken away from the hands of the government, you would see an immediate change in this nation. Amen. You'd see a change, an immediate change in this nation. Sigmund Freud, he's a, he's a uh, philosopher. He's a, he's a, um, he, he is, there are many of them, but this fellow is the one that everybody bases the idea on. He tells us what we're really made out of, how we think, what motivates us. He promoted the view that the sexual instinct is the driving force behind all human action. See, he reduced it to one thing, the sexual instinct. And of course, by reducing it to that, he reduces it to the animal, this, to the animal's category. Such a, one of his disciples was Alfred Kinsey. How many have ever heard of Mr. Kinsey? Yeah. He was no more qualified to speak on this than I am on nuclear physics. Yeah. But he, he, he promoted himself as being an expert in sexual issues of all the research that he did. You do a little research into it, you'll find out that Mr. Kinsey had a, a definite effect on what's happening in this country today. He's still preaching. They say he's responsible for the gay movement. They say he's responsible for Roe versus Wade. They say he's responsible for the sex education that's going on in the classrooms right now. He's responsible for the, for the glamorization of pornography and the loosening of sex offender laws. All you have to do is just a cursory study of Mr. Kinsey, and you'll be amazed at what you find out about this guy. You see, they don't want you to know this. The, the educational system in this country wants you to understand that, that they've been pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, filtering out all the bad, and now they've got all the good. Yeah. And you just give them your children, and they'll take care of them and yeah. give them what they need. Sure. Yeah. How do public schools brainwash young kids with harmful transgender ideology? Remember Mr. Kinsey? Militant transgender advocates are imposing their agenda with upcoming uncompromising zeal on school children. School children as young as five are being encouraged to disregard their anatomy and choose their gender based on their feelings. And I'm gonna ask you a simple question tonight. Where in the world do you think they had the idea it's their business to do this to begin with? They're to educate your children. They're to educate your children in the sciences and literature and so forth. They are not so supposed to be social reformers or social constructors to deal with the social issues. That's the place of the parents and the church. Amen. That's the place of prayer. Yes. The social issues of this country. And yet the public school system feels like that they have the authority to do it. A California mother raged at the Spreckles Union School District Board for allowing teachers to coach her 12-year-old daughter on becoming a boy without her knowledge, choosing a boy's name and hiding the plan from the family. She was enraged. There's a video of her on the internet, and you ought to hear it. She doesn't pull any punches. She lays into these people, and rightfully so. Hiding something from the parents. You know what that means? You know how that's translated? You can't trust them. When they go behind your back and they do something without bringing you into it, it's obvious you can't trust them. In Loudoun County, Virginia, this is recent news. You all know about this. A 15-year-old skirt-wearing male student who was allowed to select the school bathroom of his choosing sexually assaulted a female student, transferred to another school. The boy sexually assaulted another girl. Adding insult to injury, not long after the incident, the National School Board Association labeled parents such as the father of one of the girls who spoke out against transgender and other radical policies at school board meetings. Do you know how they, you know what they labeled him as? A domestic terrorist. You tell me we're not taking a big jump. Imagine. Your child, you're concerned that you brought them into the world. You're raising them. You look, nobody loves your children like you love your children. Amen. And you're upset because they've taken your child and they've taken liberties and they're doing this to them. And then you speak out against it and you are a domestic terrorist. You know what that means? That means that your freedom of speech is gone. This is just another approach. This is not just another attack on the First Amendment the freedom of speech. And this issue helped elect Glenn Youngkin 
to the governor's office in Virginia. That's probably the main reason that this man beat Terry McAuliffe. And he was elected as the, as the governor of the state of Virginia. And I'll, what he has done since he's been in there is to show the people that he was worthy it and he's doing everything he can to turn around and change what he can do. And it seems to me like he's an honorable man. That's an unusual thing for a polecat titian. <laughs> an honorable man. In other words, he said, I'm going to do it, and he did it. Social engineering not only dismisses the parent's authority, but prepares the child for governmental take over of parents' rights. The government's attitude about masks and vaccines is just the beginning of the man of sin's authoritarian regime. He causeth all. Now, it may seem that uh, they're concerned about your health, but they're inconsistent among themselves. But the thing is that they're forcing this issue. Why are they doing it? They're forcing it to prepare you. For when the day comes, they force you to do their bidding. Science has nothing to do with it. They say we follow the science. Well, why is one going this way and another one that way? If you're following the science, you've got split science. I'm talking about that crowd. One goes this way and one goes that. They don't even agree among themselves. Yet they say the science says it. No, there's no science. It's voodoo science. That's what the Bible calls science falsely so called. Yeah. Folks, don't ever, don't ever be afraid of some scientist or some, some historian or some uh, anthropologist or archaeologist or somebody who's going to come along and disprove the Bible. It's not going to happen. Amen. This is God's eternal inspired Amen. word. Amen. Amen. He causeth all. Make a note of that tonight. I don't know what the mark of the beast is going to be, but I know one thing. I know they're going to push it on you. They're going to force it on you. And they're going to push you into that. And that's where it's headed. That's where it's headed. How many of you can see that? How many of you can see? Do you really believe that the governor of California and the governors of these states really care about the health of the people? Not at all. I don't believe it for a minute. They don't care anything about their health. Most of the time, the only one that cares anything about the health of children is the parents. John Maynard Keyes. He advocated the policies for reducing unemployment and expanding the economy that today find their expression in deficit spending and governmental activism. Now, let me give you, a, give you a case of governmental activism. Illegal aliens come across the southern border. The parents are separated from the children. The children have to stay somewhere and the parents somewhere and so forth. They have their reasons for all of this. But now that they have been reunited, they're going to court and they're suing the very country that they illegally broke into for separating them from their children. And the, the governmental activism wants to give them $450,000 ahead. It took me over 50 years to pay for my house. Every month, every month. Took me over 50 years to pay for my house. It wasn't handed to me. I worked for it, and I'm, I'm thankful to God I could. There's something bad wrong when people in this country can't even afford to get a doctor. I read about a man the other day that died because he could not afford a doctor. A U.S. citizen that can't get a doctor, and you're going to give an illegal alien $450,000 Something's bad, 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 bad wrong. And that's not to mention the fact that we're $30 trillion in debt. You know how much a trillion dollars is? 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, if you started spending a million dollars a day for 2,000 years, get a hold of that now. A million dollars a day for 2,000, you would not reach a trillion dollars, one trillion. You could spend a million dollars every day for 2,000 years. Some say, I don't believe it. Get your math out. Do the math. <laughs> We've done it before many times. It comes out somewhere around 800 billion, 850 billion, somewhere in there. It takes 1,000 billion to make a, to make a trillion. And it's not even a trillion dollars. And yet we're $30 trillion in debt. Do you know what brought Nazi Germany down? And brought, didn't bring Nazi Germany down. It took down the Reimer Republic and then allowed Nazi Germany, him to rise. Their money wasn't worth anything. 
after World War I. It's getting to where your money may not be worth anything. Look at the inflation as it flies up. Amen. Think about Amen. that. Our president said that when I go in office, your taxes will not go up. I'm glad for that, but everything else has gone up. Amen. And the more you pay for something, the more tax you're going to pay. Your taxes have gone up. It's kind of like the fellow before him who said, if you want to keep your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Now, preach a lot and get out of here. You're in politics and all of that. But that's truth. <laughs> then there's Soren Kierkegaard. Who is that? This man is a philosopher. He stressed the obligation each person has to make conscious, responsible choices among alternatives. Now, well, listen carefully. A major tenet of existentialism. What is existentialism? It's a big word. Here's, a, here's an illustration of it. When Nikita Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba, 90 miles away yeah. from the American continent, from yeah. America, he did not threaten the United States. No. He just put the missiles down there. But the fact that they were there was an existential threat. Yeah. The easy way to remember what that word means is look at the first part of it. Yeah. See, look at the first part of the word. E-X-I-S-T. It exists. See that? That helps me when I, I try to find things like that. It pulls it out. Uh -huh. The fact that it exists, all right, provides some kind of a threat or whatever that it has to do with. But here's the thing about existentialism. It leads to moral relativism. Yes. Now, what's moral relativism? Well, it depends on what your culture is. Yeah. It depends on how you were raised. Yeah. It depends on where you are. You see, relativism means that you can be whatever you want to be anytime you want to be it, just like transgenderism is relativism. There's no absolutes in relativism. There's no absolute truth. There's no God. Relativism is, I heard one the other day, and he said it very well. He said, my truth is this. I thought, yeah, you're a relativist. Your truth. That's as meaningless as it can be. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the embodiment and personage of the truth. He's absolute truth. He's not the truth of the Christian. He's the truth, period. That's what he is. So we have uh, moral relativism. So what does that mean? That means that the public school system is pumping them out every single day. And let me say this too. I, I was sitting in the classroom one time. The teacher said this. said, you're not going to learn everything there is to learn. Nobody knows everything there is to know. No. Teacher said, one of the greatest things you're going to learn from this class is how to find something. I've thought many times since then, you'll learn where to look. You'll learn how to research. You'll learn how to find something. Now, let me be kind to you tonight. If you don't know how to find something, you are a brainwashed. You may have a college degree, but you don't know how to think. You, don't, you can't think. You can't, you can't make a rational decision about anything. This is why. This is why. That when this speaker was up there at, what, Yale the other day, and all these kids were in there, okay, they're studying for law, <laughs> And here they are, and this speaker of, was on the other side of wokeism. Yeah. The other side. He was anti-wokeism. <laughs> they wouldn't let him speak. They wouldn't let him speak. What are you afraid of? Where's the dialogue? The Bible says, let us come and reason together, saith the Lord. Right? When the apostle Paul was in Athens... When he was in Athens, he went from one group to the next group to the next group to the next group. Yeah. He wasn't afraid of any of them. That's right. He said, let me introduce you to the unknown God. That's right. yeah. You have nothing to fear, but here's a sad thing. This is the saddest of all, folks. You've gone for four years. You've got a bachelor's degree. Maybe you've gone six or seven, a master's. You may even have a PhD. But if all you know is wokeism, if that's all you know, you're not, you're not educated. You're brainwashed. And I, here's the problem with all this. I don't understand 
that if you've got that education, why don't you bother to do some research into what you've got? Amen. Do some research into it. Yeah. Read, study, yeah. compare both sides. I've read their side. Listen, I've read some of the best atheists in the country. Good atheist. And after a few years, I finally came to a conclusion about atheist. I've never known an atheist or ever read an atheist who ever one time attempted to prove there is no God by science. Every last one of them are mad at God. They've got an issue. They've got a problem. There's something wrong somewhere. Most of the time, the same with an agnostic. The difference between an atheist and an agnostic, an agnostic is the Greek word Gnosticism means to know. Agnostic means not know. So an agnostic is one who I'm not sure. I don't know. That's what he says. Atheist? Atheist is atheist. I'm against theism. I don't believe there is a God. That's what an atheist is. There is no God. Now our country is full of agnostics and atheists. And they came straight out of the school system. They did not come out of the science classroom. The truth of the matter is, if you, if, you, if you really begin to look at science today and see what they're discovering and look at, listen to these men who, good night, so many of them were atheists until they got into some stuff and they came out of it and they said, there's no way in this world that that could have just happened spontaneously. There had to be a guiding hand. And there, of course, was. There was. This is. It's the Almighty. Not at all less. So what have we got to offer that's different from all of this? What do we have that's greater than this? I'm going to tell you what we have. We've got a person that's alive. Yeah. That's what we've got. Yeah. A person that's alive. Yeah. There's a doctor over here in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Virginia, uh, Brother Falwell's church. Where was that? Lynchburg. Lynchburg. And he had, a, he had meningitis. His name's Alexander. He's an MD. He had meningitis. His, 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 his brain stem was swollen, fully infected, and he was losing it. And finally, he clinically died. He was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. But something happened to him during that period of time, what they call clinical death. You know, there's a difference here. And when he came out of that, which was a miracle in itself, he started preaching to everybody around him. And he's still preaching. There is a God, believe me. He's there. Make no mistake about it. And these are some of the smartest people in the country. The idea is that you got to be pretty dumb to believe in God. No, you got to be dumb to be, be called an atheist because you haven't really looked at it. The Bible says that we have, a, we have, to, have to have a reason for the, to give an account for the faith that is within us, for our faith. The studies show thyself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I have never in my lifetime, since I've been born again, 1973, I have never met a Christian, a Christian that didn't believe the Bible. Right. Every one of them believed it. It's just natural to believe it. God wrote the Bible. Yes, he did. Men wrote the Bible. No, holy men of moved they as they were moved by the holy spirit they wrote the bible the inspiration the theos neustos god breathed into them and they wrote the bible yeah. if you don't believe the bible's true and i told a fellow that was an atheist this one time walk outside put that fist up there and say well i'm going to tell you what if you got the gall to do it uh -huh. if there's really a god i'd like for you to show me Amen, Pastor. Amen. Well, I wouldn't do that at all, preacher. Why not? If there's no God, God, what are you worried about? Get you a crowd around. <laughs> Let them watch you do it. Shake your fist in the face of God. Now, let me warn you. Let me warn you. Because when he reveals himself, he may reveal himself in a way you can't imagine. Yes, he will. I lived all, I was 27 years old, folks. I was 27. Before I experienced in my life, I had never experienced what I was about to experience in 1973. 
I had a dread come down over me. I didn't ask for it. I wasn't seeking for it. I had a dread come down over me that took hold of me like nothing has ever taken hold of me. That dread came down upon my soul and I couldn't get it off. And I'm telling you right now, I hunted me a preacher. I wanted somebody to come and pray with me and get that off of me. And boy, when I bowed my head and said, Father, save me, be merciful to me, a sinner. I bowed it on that sofa. I'll never forget the moment that I raised my head back up. And glory to God. It just left me like that. Well, hallelujah. It just left, folks. It did. And it hadn't come back. It hadn't come back. It just left. It just left. Well, you say, preacher, that's not for everybody. He died for everybody. He died for all. Amen. He died for all. And he died for you. I have to, I have to emphasize this. I was not seeking God. I was not trying to do good. I used to play the pinball machine while my wife went to church. I didn't care anything about church until that dread came down on my soul. Father, thank you tonight, Lord. Bless your word. Maybe somebody in the house tonight, and that's happening to them. And they don't know what to do. Oh, Lord, I'm going to tell them what to do. Just come to you. Just acknowledge it. In simple faith, say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save yes. me. Whatever words want to come out of their mouth from a heart that wants to be saved. Yes, and I know you. You'll save them. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let's stand up tonight, folks. Page 375, the All American Church hymnal, just as I am. Something else, boy. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed. Something else. Bill Cardwell was the pastor of Third Creek Baptist Church. When I got saved, I showed up that following Sunday. I sat down on the front row, and that man of God got up and started preaching, and I didn't know anybody else was in that building. I was taken in everything he had to say. That's the first time in my life that I did it. I just couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough. Read the Bible, pray, want to be at the preaching. All of that, folks, that's, that's when your life changes. I didn't make a change. I didn't, do, I didn't turn over a leaf and say, I'm going to do better. I didn't make any covenants with God. He just came on my soul. And when he did, he changed me. He changed me. And the change is eternal. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> hey, brother. Yeah. The next day, <laughs> I was going home early, and he runs into the locker room and goes, You haven't left it. I gotta get saved. I gotta get saved. And I said, Bro, we can get saved right here. He wouldn't get saved there, but I told him to go. I said, Go find you a corner and pray and call out to God. And yeah. The next morning, his whole family was on that road right there. <laughs> he got, he got, he. He got saved. He got right with God. Well, that's a challenge. Everybody likes challenges. TikTok and all the rest of the challenges. I never, I never watch them, but I hear about them. So I challenge you. You won't make God mad. You're not even a speck of dust. <laughs> Abraham, when he came before God, he said, "Nothing." I said, "I who am dust and ashes." That's what he said to the Lord. Abraham did. He said, "But I want to plead for these people." Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? He will. Because if in your heart you're sincere about it and you mean what you're doing, he knows. All right. Thank you, Lord. Bless your word. Bless these dear folk, Father. Your word will not return void. 
Maybe somebody in the house tonight, somebody watching this, somebody watching it later, you'll use it to help them. In thy name I pray, amen.